Good morning, Pastor Mark Driscoll here from Oakdale Free Methodist Church. It's good to be, <coughs> excuse me, good to be with you this morning. It's good to be able to spend some time in the Word. Glad that you've joined me this morning to spend some time in the Word of God. Uh, we started yesterday on a two-part thing where we're talking about God's building project. That that when you become a Christian, one of the things that happens is that God begins this restoration process in your life. Um, a lot of people don't realize that being a Christian is not just about being converted. It's not just about uh, praying a prayer and going to heaven. It's about the initiating. God initiates a transformation in your life. When you, when you surrender to Christ and you allow Him to lead and to rule in your life, you allow Him to be Lord, then through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the work of His Word, and through fellowship with the church and your daily experiences, God begins this process of rebuilding you. And that's what it means when it says, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creature. The old has passed away. All things are made new. The mistake comes when we think it all happens overnight. Now, lots of things can happen overnight. Lots of really powerful things can happen overnight. And, uh, you know, when I first gave my life to Christ, I knew immediately something was different. But over the years, that's been 40 years ago, there have been a lot of things that over time that God has begun to work in my life. And there are still renovations going on. Well, yesterday we talked about the, uh, the part of holiness. And this is what we're talking about, holiness. Um, sanctification is a big fancy word, which really means God making you holy. That's, that's all that means. And so it's this process of God making me what he has already called me. You see, when I get saved, he has called me perfect and innocent and, and righteous in his sight. But God's not, not going to just say that. Um, he's going to make that reality. And so he, he calls me his own. He calls me adopted. When he looks at me, he sees the innocence and the purity of his son because his son lives in me. But God then begins over time to conform my my nature my character my thoughts my actions into the image of jesus christ and so while he's already accepted me as if that process were done now he's making a reality so first part we talked about yesterday where we have to put to death the things that, that are earthly we put to death the things that are that are, are like the world um the, the the sexual immorality the greed the pride the lust, the jealousy, the bitterness, the uh, materialism, the uh, the division, the hatefulness, all those kinds of things that the world really values and uh, and says, oh, this is, if you're going to make it, and this is the things you need to do. But um, Jesus, he begins to take those things away and say, you know what, you've got to get rid of those things, put them to death. Not, don't put them to sleep until you need them later. Put them to death, right? Well, that's the part of holiness that's, that's, that's really hard um, because it means you have to die to some things, right? Well, then the, the thing is, is that holiness is not just about what you get rid of. It's not just about what you don't do anymore. It's not just about what you stop doing. It's now beginning to incorporate some really awesome and wonderful things. And so we're going to get into that. Let's begin with prayer and then we'll jump right into it. Father, thank you that you have called us to be holy. You have said, you shall be holy for I am holy. And you have made us uh, righteous in your sight. You have declared us righteous. Those who turn from their sin and trust in you are justified, made holy in your sight. And then, Lord, you're, you're moving us forward. You're creating something new in us. Now, Lord, I pray that you guide us today as we look into your word and, and we discover what it really means to continue to grow into your image, to continue to be made in your likeness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see, the idea is that God calls us to be holy. Now, you've read, if you've read your Bible, you've probably read a statement where it says, you shall be holy for I am holy. Right, be holy for I am holy. God told Abraham, He said, Walk before me and be blameless. Right? And the Bible says, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Um, and you know, so here's the thing is that holiness is part of uh, being His child. He, he wants us to be a holy people. Right? We get that. Now, what we need to understand is that holiness is, is like I said, it's not just about, okay, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. It is, there are some things we no longer do, 
But holiness is about incorporating the very person of God himself. You see, holiness is not just something God wants you to achieve. It is something that God wants you to receive. You see, holiness is God imparting his character into your being through the work of the Holy Spirit. That he gives you all the resources of, of being who Jesus is on the earth. That walk like him, talk like him, think like him, love like him. Uh, even do miracles like him to be a manifestation of the person of Jesus Christ on the earth. Not because you earn it somehow and you work your way up to some level of holiness. No, it's not about that. It's about receiving what God has already given you and allowing God to create his own life in you. And so uh, in Philippians, it says it like this. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to work and, and to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, God is putting those things in you, and now you work them out. This is what Paul's talking about. We talked yesterday, get rid of the junk, get rid of the, the old drywall, the old plumbing, the bad stuff. The, the old. If you're going to rebuild a house, you tear out all the junk, you tear out all the mess, all the stuff that doesn't work anymore, all the stuff that does not honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the great news is we don't just get rid of bad stuff that we get to incorporate becoming like him. And this is where John, where Paul starts off in verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to look at verses 12 through 17. Listen to this. Paul says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Now let, let me just get, start here. This is a really important thing. That before he even talks about what you're to put on, Paul says, first, put on. Which means that there's some there's some intentionality there, right? He says, "Put on." We're going to read about some characteristics that we're to put on. No, we don't just wait passively and hope God makes us righteous. That we put it on. Now He's already done all the hard work. He's already redeemed us through His blood. He's already given us the Holy Spirit. He's already drawn us by His grace. He's done all the hard stuff. Now He says to us, "Now that I've given you all this, put it on." Put it on. Um, I love to use the analogy when I was in high school. I played football. I wasn't that great. But anyway, I was on the team. They gave me all the equipment. First of the year, what do they do? You go by the table. You pick up your helmet. You get your pads. You get all those things. You get your locker and you put everything in the locker, right? But what if I never put the equipment on? What if I came to practice every day after school and I never went by and got my helmet and my pads and those, those kinds of things, never put the cleats on, never, I'd get obliterated on the ball field if they even let me on the field. I got obliterated as it was with the stuff on, <laughs> to be totally honest. But see, I had to put it on. It was, it was already mine. They had already, by virtue of being part of the team, they had already given me the equipment. It was already, my name was on it. I had the little number on my jersey. It was my number. And I had my name on the, on the helmet. And I had all this kind of stuff. But what good is that if I don't put it on? You see, this is what Paul's saying. God in Christ Jesus has given you everything you need for life and godliness. That's what it says in 2 Peter chapter 1. He's given us everything we need. You've got everything in, in Christ, in his word, in the spirit. Everything you need to live the life he's called you to live for him. You've got everything. You don't need anything extra. And so, but, but you've got to put it on. But then he goes on to say, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You see, before he even talks about becoming holy, he wants you to know that you're already chosen, you're already holy, and you're already beloved. Isn't that great news? Before you even talk about what God wants you to do, you need to understand that he's already pleased with you. He already loves you because that's who he is. It's his grace that has chosen you. It's his grace that has already called you holy. And it's his grace that calls you beloved. So I need to understand something because the religious mindset is that I'm a really bad person and that God is not happy with me. And so if I work really, really hard, then I'll be chosen and holy and beloved. That's not where we start here, is it? That's where they were starting in Colossae. That's where the legalists and the Judaizers and the pagan religions, that's where they were starting. You're, you know, if you'll just work really hard, you'll be accepted by God. Well, here's the thing. Paul's saying you're already accepted. Isn't that great news? You're already beloved. You're already called holy. So you've already got that. We don't work from a, from a, a position of hoping to be good enough. 
We work from a position of already being accepted, already being called holy, already being called beloved. So I don't pursue holy, and this is so important. This will, this will change the whole way you live your Christian life. I don't pursue holiness in an attempt to get God to like me. I pursue holiness because he already loves me, and I want to return the favor. I want to give back to him what he's already given to me. You see, that's we love because he first loved us. It's that response of love, the response of love. And so being a Christian is simply about responding in faith and love to what God has already done. I read yesterday one preacher said that the center, center of the gospel is not what we do for God, but what God has already done for us. And so this is the basis of what we're about to move into. And if you don't, you got to get this. This is why I'm taking so much time with this, because I want you to understand we are not trying to get you to try to earn God's love. We're not trying to get you to earn a place in heaven. That's by grace. That's by God's wonderful love and acceptance of you. He's already received you. He's already brought you in. You might say, well, why should I do anything in response to that if I don't have to do anything? Well, friend, if you're thinking that, that shows that your heart just may not be ready. Your heart may not be fully with God in the first place. If you're only going to work for God if you have to, then that might show that you've got a religious spirit and that you're, you're, trying, you're, you're trying to come up some other way and you've not really come by faith. Because when you come by faith, when you repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus and he puts his love in you, there's a desire to know him and to love him. And if you do not have that desire, friend, then I'm going to say something hard. You don't know him. And I know I'm not supposed to tell people that they may not, but you don't. Um, because it's the love of God that comes into our heart that changes us. And so it may be good for you to back up and say, Lord, I need you in my life. I need you to save me because I'm still focused on me and I've not yet surrendered to you. And so here's the thing. Put on then as, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Now he gets into these things and we're going to read each one of them. And these are all characteristics of the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's a whole lot here of the character of Jesus. And I'm not saying, when I say, when I say that if you don't want to serve him, you don't really know him, I'm not saying if you're not perfect in all of this that you don't really know. I'm not saying that at all. None of us are perfect in this. None of us have all these things working in our life. We have, we have access to them. You know, through the Holy Spirit living in you, you have access to every one of these things that Paul listed. Because you don't get it out of yourself. You don't get it out of your own strength. You don't work this up. You receive it and say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to put it on. What does it mean to put on compassion? Here's what it means. It means to say to the Lord Jesus, Lord, you are compassionate and you live in me. And because I know you live in me, I pray you would release your compassion through me. You see, you're asking him to be himself through you. This is the key difference. You're not saying, Lord, help me be more compassionate. No, that's, that's a religious prayer. Lord, help me be more compassionate. No, don't do that. I used to do that. What I say is, Lord, you're compassionate. You've got all the compassion I need. Now, Lord, release your compassion through me. The next word is uh, kindness. Lord, you're very kind. Be kind in me. Be kind through me. Let others experience your kindness through me. Humility. Lord, show your humility through me. 
meekness. That means self-control. It means strength under control. It means I don't fly off the handle every time I'm not happy. It means I can drive through traffic and people can be annoying and I can still control my temper. Patience. Patience. That's the ability to, to faithfully keep moving forward even in the most difficult times. Bearing with one another. You know, the reality is that as Christians, we have to deal with some junk from people. Sometimes people have to deal with some junk from us. Like, even though we're in Christ, we're not flawless and perfect, and our personalities bump into one another, and we have to bear with each other. Sometimes you've got to deal with a difficult worker, a difficult co-worker, a difficult spouse, a difficult child, parent, a difficult neighbor. You've just got to do that. And if somebody has a complaint against each other, forgive each other. I want you to notice this. Listen to this. If one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. He said forgive three times in one sentence. Did you notice that? Three times in one sentence, he says, well, look, we got to forgive because the Lord forgave us. we got to forgive. You, he knows because he knows, A, this is the most one of the most difficult things we do is forgive someone who has genuinely and truthfully hurt us or misrepresented us or mistreated us. And he said, you gotta, but you know what? It's the cornerstone of the gospel. Jesus told us very clearly that the, the level of my knowledge of God has to do with my ability to forgive. That, that for me to, to say he has forgiven me, but then I refuse to forgive you is a real contradiction. He who bled and bled and shed sinless blood on the cross for my sins is calling me to forgive those who've hurt me. And so there's so much we could say about this. And it says, and above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. In fact, the real heart of Christianity is love. It's a sacrificial love of God. Not, not the tolerant, politically correct, ooey-gooey, uh, pseudo-love of this world, but the kind of love that's holy, the kind of love that's righteous and just, the kind of love that puts God first, the kind of love that sacrifices self for the sake of others, the kind of love that is like the love we see on the cross. And then it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were indeed called. You know what that means? That God called you to live in peace, not just with each other, but peace with yourself. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Um, is his peace ruling in your heart? Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not the peace the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. The peace of Christ rules in our hearts. You see, Jesus, even in his worst times of conflict, walked in peace. He walked in peace. He was, he was sure of who he was. He was sure of the love of his Father. He walked in peace. And he wants that peace to rule your heart. Many of us, our hearts are ruled by everything but peace. They're ruled by anxiety. They're ruled by anger. They're ruled by jealousy. They're ruled by lust. What's your heart ruled by today? What's reigning in your heart today? So when I begin my time with God each day, I say, Lord Jesus, I need your peace to rule in my heart right now. Listen, when you find yourself in anxiety, you find yourself in conflict and in difficulty, that's the time to call on the Lord Jesus because he lives in you and say, Lord Jesus, right now, I need you to rule in my heart. I need your peace to rule in my heart right now in the middle of this storm, in the middle of this conflict, in the middle of this angry meeting, in the middle of traffic, in the middle of this fight with my spouse. I need you to rule in my heart with peace. And see that you're drawing from him. You're not trying to be good enough for him. You're asking him for help. You're saying, Lord, I don't have that kind of peace, but you do. I need you to give me that peace. And then you just sit with him and allow him to put his peace in the middle of your situation. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And you know what peace is. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. Peace doesn't mean that we're not having problems. Peace doesn't deny the reality of the storm. Peace acknowledges the presence of God in the midst of the storm. And that everything's okay because God is here with me in the midst of the storm. And then he goes on to say, in verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. He's talking about letting your life 
be grounded in the Word of God. Fill your life with the Word of God. Friends, uh, you've got to open the book. You've got to open the book and spend time in it. You've got to meditate on it. You've got to read it and read it a lot. I want to challenge you today to not be one of those people who neglects the Word of God and wonders why they don't feel the presence of God. I wonder. I don't want you to be one of those people that's always saying, God, speak to me, but they never open the book of His clear, objective Word to them. And don't be like those so-called uh, progressive, hyper-progressive people who minimize the importance of the Word of God. That, that we don't live by our feelings. We don't live by our politics. We don't live by our, our own sense of right. We live by the truth of God's Word. And so, what does Jesus say? Well, let's find it here. Let it, let it dwell in you richly. Does the Word of God dwell in you richly? Or is it minimal? Do you just barely... Uh, get hold of it. You barely ingest any of it. Maybe a, a verse in the morning and then you don't think about anything else. Friend, take time during the day, throughout the day, to stop and fill your heart with the Word of God. And what does that lead to? It says, singing to one another in psalms and hymns. This is a heart of praise. Be a worshiper. Be a person who worships God throughout the day. This is what, what the Holy Spirit calls us to do. There's one place where Jesus uh, said, rejoiced in spirit and said, Father, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to children. He, he was praising right in the middle of a moment here. He was just praising God in the middle of his day. Do you ever worship the Lord? Do you take time throughout your day just to worship him and just to praise him and just to thank him when you're driving in your car, when you're walking to a new place, when you're alone in your office? Or you just take time to worship him and connect with him? You see, this is, this is what helps us grow. And then the, the, the last part of it is verse 17. Everything is summed up in verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, everything I do suddenly becomes holy. Everything I, work, I say and do suddenly becomes occasion to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. That means if I go to a board meeting, I do it in his name. I'm attending this board meeting in the name of Jesus. Therefore, I want to represent him well in this meeting. If I go to a ball game, I go there to a, in the name of Jesus. I go there with him. Not win, Winning is great. We love to cheer for our teams and, and all that kind of stuff. But what the real deal is, how do I represent him in the midst of that? Whatever I do in word or deed, I do it in the name of of Jesus, that suddenly everything becomes holy. My relationships become holy. My job becomes holy. My menial tasks become holy. My thoughts become holy. My entertainment, my recreation becomes holy when I get home after, after a long day of work and I let my hair down. Where, where, what comes out? <laughs> I always ask people, be careful how you let your hair down because who knows what's going to come out of it. In other words, when I'm having rest time, is it, is it something that I, do I say, okay, I'm going to put God away now because I, I need to entertain myself with this filthy movie or I need to entertain myself with this filthy book or this, this ungodly activity because, you know, God's just got to be human. Really? Well, if that's true, then, then we need to ask ourselves just how authentic our faith is. If I can turn it on and off and if I need a break, from serving him when, I, when I'm at the end of the day. Um, if, I, if I need to finally be myself when everybody's not looking, then friend, I've got a bigger problem than I might imagine. You see, Jesus wants me to live for him all the time. Whatever I do, I do in his name. There should never be a place in my life where I'm, I'm intentionally and purposefully doing something that I know does not bring honor to him. That there, there is no part-time, there is no off-time in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. He must permeate everything in my life, everything I do, everything I say, everywhere I go. The preacher who is holy in his church on Sunday, but then when the preacher goes off for the weekend to a conference or somewhere and they, they check into a hotel and, and then they begin to say, oh, it's good to be away from the crowds. Now I can do what I really want to do. Oh, friend. You might want to ask yourself why you really want to do that which God has commanded you not to do. You might want to ask yourself why you've decided that it's okay when I'm not in the public eye to be ungodly, to be immoral, 
to be violent, to be greedy, whatever it is that I'm shifting over into. Oh, friend, let's not go there. Let's, let's be holy. Let's put on the, the, the armor of God, the presence of Jesus. Let's put on His words, His activities, His thoughts. Let's put on His compassion and His kindness and His humility. And say, Lord Jesus, I, I, I need you. I, and, and as I pray, Holy Spirit, I need your humility. Holy Spirit, I need your kindness. Holy Spirit, I need your compassion. And, and as you pray, and it, see, this, this, all of these commands should bring us to a place of needing Him. Not a place of trying to be something we're not, but a place of saying, Lord Jesus, I need you to be yourself through me. You see, I'm drawing on His strength. I'm drawing on Him. What do you need from Him today? What part of His character that He, if you're a Christian, He's put it in you. It's in there. You've got everything. You've got access to all of it. What do you need today? What are you facing today that you're going to need his help with? Then ask him. Ask him. And we can't be selective. We can't say, oh, I only get it when I need it. You know what? He wants us to be living for him all the time. But that comes through dependence on the Holy Spirit and investment in the Word of God. And so I rely on the Spirit who's in me, and I fill my mind and heart with the Word of God. And I fill my life with praise. So there's three hints in here in this text that we can find to help us here. Number one is that I need to put on what the Holy Spirit has put in. That's number one. Number two, I need to fill my heart with the Word of God because see what you fill your heart and mind with is what's going to come out. So Lord, I need to fill my heart and mind with your Word. And number three, I need to worship Him. Singing songs of praise. You know, the more I worship God, the more I praise Him throughout my day, the more I honor Him the more he fills my life and the more he, he fills my mind and my heart. So what do you need from him today? Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you that you're building us into your image, that you're, you're not just making us converts who get to go to heaven, but you're making us little models of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, change us today. Rip out the evil. Rip out the old drywall of dead works. And, and Lord, put in the new plumbing of faith and hope and love. Lord, make us new today. And we promise to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today. Go in peace.